from the corner of 16th and Peachtree Street, right next to the High Museum of Art in Midtown Atlanta. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church. My name is Tony Sundermeyer, the senior pastor, and I want to thank you for watching today's broadcast. Now, I invite you to join in the worship of God. Friends, good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. I want to welcome you to First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta. My name is Tony Sundermeyer. I'm one of the pastors. Uh, it is good to be together, where you're, whether you're here in the room or live streaming online. Uh, we are so thankful because we need each other uh, to be a more fuller expression of the body of Christ in and for the city, in and for the world, and for one another. Uh, before we begin our time of worship, we're going to invite you to stand and move about the sanctuary, find a face you do or do not recognize. But in every encounter, let's say good morning and welcome. Good morning. My name is Cliff Orr. I am currently serving as an elder on session here at First Presbyterian. Please join me in our call to worship. God of jubilee, God of freedom, from oppression and healing for the afflicted, we gather to share your good news. We gather to be transformed as the world is changed. In this time of worship, may we be in body and soul as we sing and pray, as we break the bread and pour the cup. May the Spirit of the Lord fall upon us. May we be refreshed, anointed, and empowered. And when our time of worship is ended, send us back out into the world to proclaim the good news. We pray in the name and memory of Jesus, our rock and our redeemer, and our guide in whom we find the paths that leads to the kingdom. Friends, let us worship our God.
means the proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. Grounded in God's grace, let us confess our sin before God and one another, first in unison and then in silence. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. And now, O oh God, hear the silent prayers of all of our hearts. Amen. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. God has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's loving kindness towards those who fear the Lord. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen.
would like to take a special moment to extend a special welcome to all of our children who are worshiping with us. We like to remind you that you are an important part of our congregation and therefore a very important part of our worship service. And we are glad that you are with us this morning. If you are in first, if you are kindergarten and younger, um, you have the option to go to choir. And so I'm going to invite you to come down front if you want to go to choir, but you're going to hang out for a minute because you guys can come right up here and get a front row spot and then we'll go to choir together. I'll direct you to page eight, which is our children's page. Um, which is filled with questions to further reflect throughout our worship service that is not just for children. Anyone is welcome to look at that page. And while you're there, I'll direct you to page nine, which has a list of names, which are the names of our third grade children who will be receiving their Bibles this morning. Uh, some of you may have been here two weeks ago when we gave Bibles to our pre-K children and celebrated that milestone in their lives. And this morning, we will celebrate a similar milestone in the life of our third grade children who are on this faith journey. And these Bibles will be given as a gift from our congregation. They are their, what I like to call their grown-up Bibles that look grown-up on the outside and are filled on the inside with uh, ways to help children further learn the Bible stories that we have through the Word. So boys and girls, I am going to call your name, and when you hear your name, you can come up front, and Pastor Tony will give you your Bible, and you're going to stay up front until we have all been called. Reed Berry, Caroline Bold, Anna Kate Connors, Mackenzie Cummings, Candler Dunlap, Caroline Lamont, Reese Madden, and Myla Marshall. And if there are any third graders present whose name I did not call, we'd love for you to come forward and we will make sure you get one. There you go. You're welcome. You have one too. All right. Uh, as Sarah Kate said, uh, we are so grateful for the presence of children in the life of this uh, congregation, and we're especially thankful on this day for our third graders. We had a bunch of third graders at the 9 o'clock service, a bunch more here at 11. We're so thankful for your love and your encouragement and your faithfulness and all that you teach us about who God is and who we're being called to be as followers of Christ. We want to thank you for your families. I'm going to have, uh, invite uh, any parents or grandparents of any of these children up front here to stand where you are. Great. Stay standing. I'm going to pray for them and pray for you. And uh, we give thanks to God for your families and for the gifts uh, that these children bring to this congregation. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for every good gift that you give us. We're thankful for this third grade class. We thank you for their parents and grandparents, their siblings, uh, all who pour themselves into them so that they would know your love. Would you continue to use us to do the same as a larger congregation? May we be faithful to your call in loving them, and may we uh, give them all the space they need to teach us about who you are and who your spirit is forming and calling us to be. For these gifts, we say thank you in Christ's name, and all of God's people say amen. You may be seated, and you can go back. Thanks, guys. How are you, pal? Good to see you, man. Okay, you can go with Sarah. Good morning. Please turn in your pew Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, 5 and 6, 8 and 10, and that's found on page 416 in the Old Testament. Listen to God's word. All the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday, 
in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and the scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. This is the word of the Lord. Our second text, which also comes from the lectionaries from the Gospel of Luke, the fourth chapter, verses 14 through 21, continue to listen to God's word to you and to me. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues, and he was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Friends, this too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please stand as we sing hymn number 288, three times through, Spirit of the Living God.
as we stand in your presence, we pray that your spirit would fall afresh upon us, that your word would be broken open unto us, so that we would be different people than those who came into this sacred space, even to be more like your son, Jesus the Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. For about the past uh, six months, I have uh, committed to a pretty regular workout that includes a little bit of cardio and some weight training. And while the results may not be uh, immediate, over time, if you commit yourself to this kind of routine, uh, you can begin to notice a physical difference in your body. Right? You can begin to notice... Uh, endurance. You can begin to notice stamina. You can begin to notice strength. You can begin to notice even muscle tone. I have a friend that committed to a, a similar workout routine as I have, and he said to me the other day, Tony, I have back muscles for the first time since high school. I can actually feel them, right? When you, when you commit to a workout routine like that, if you stick with it, your outward appearance will change. You'll garner strength, and you'll begin to physically grow. You can feel it. A few months ago, in the midst of this new workout, I started to experience some significant knee pain, so significant that I shared it with Katie. I, I shared it with friends, shared it with congregants, and to a person every time I would describe the pain, every time I would describe the location of the pain, someone would say, ooh, it sounds like you tore something. So I went to see an orthopedic specialist, had an appointment, they took an x-ray, I was waiting in uh, the office, the doctor came in and said, Tony, there's good news, the x-ray is fine. There's no structural damage at all, nothing to be concerned about. I said, but, but doc, there's real pain, and I want to know where it is coming from. So he had me lay down on my back on the, on the table in his office. He had me throw my left leg over my right side. He said, if it is what I think it is, this is going to hurt. Not what you want to hear your doctor say. So he pressed up toward my hip, and sure enough, it hurt. And then he said, uh, how about this? And he pressed a little lower, and it hurt. And he just worked his way down from my hip all the way down to my patella tendon, and he pressed it and said, does this hurt? I said, yes, it hurts. He said, Tony, it's your IT band. He said, it's too tight. I looked at him, conveying that I had no idea what an IT band was. And he said, your IT band is the longest tendon in your body. It actually runs from your hip all the way into your knee. I said, well, good. I'm glad we know what it is. How do I fix it? And he said, Tony, you're at an age where you have to stretch. And I heard the voice of my wife, Katie. Every time I came home from my new workout routine, did you stretch? I said, I don't need to stretch. You have to stretch, it turns out. Doctor said you gotta stretch or it'll continue to be uncomfortable and the pain will actually continue to grow, not just in your knee, but in your whole leg and eventually it would be your whole body. Sure enough, some six weeks later with a new stretching routine to accompany my, my workout, the pain totally went away. It completely subsided. Now, this experience has taught me a lot of things, one of which is how magnificent and well-constructed the human body is. But it also taught me this uh, deeper truth. You can't just pay attention to the outward appearance. You can't just pay attention to what's physical. You cannot just pay attention to what is visible right in front of your eyes. You have to be attentive to that which is invisible or below the surface. If those tendons or those areas of life are not cared for, or if those areas are not tended to, the whole body can actually suffer. Our text from Nehemiah chapter 8, I think, is about that kind of attentiveness. 
It's about the kind of attention we must pay, not just to the physical or outward or visible aspects of life, but the kind of attention we must pay to spiritual things, to things unseen, to things that are deep within us and deep within the world, things that are internal. Uh, Nehemiah, to give a little bit of a, of a background here, Nehemiah was a, Drew, a Jew, but he was living in uh, Persia. We're told that he had a pretty high position in the court of King Artaxerxes I. Now, King Artaxerxes, his throne was in what is present-day Iran, and we're talking about the 5th century B.C., and ne Nehemiah, if you were here last week, he's, he's described as the cupbearer, or maybe the wine steward, or maybe perhaps he was the sommelier for the king. Now, the Persians have sort of a high view in this part of Israel's story because it's the Persians that have defeated Israel's enemies and has allowed for them to go back home. It's King Artaxerxes that has said that, 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 that the Jews may go back to Jerusalem, to go back to Judah after generations, generations of Babylonian captivity, generations of Jews who had never seen that land, who had never seen that holy city. Well, as you can imagine, after multiple generations being gone, the city was in disrepair. The infrastructure was completely devastated. And somehow, in some way, Nehemiah gets word of this devastation. He gets word of this destruction. Details are brought to him in King Artaxerxes' court. Details that describe how the city walls have come crumbling down. And how the economy is nothing now. And how the, the city has come to a complete stop. And Nehemiah, maybe motivated by the very Spirit of God, has a bold request for his king. He asks if he can go to Jerusalem. If he can go and if he could be tasked to rebuild the city walls. He has a desire to inaugurate an urban revitalization project for the city of Jerusalem. And the king says yes. The king not only says yes, not only gives him a blessing, but he confers to him the title of governor of this region. Nehemiah now has a job to do. He goes back to Judah. He goes back to this city that is in disrepair, and he does what he was set out to do. He restores the city. He gathers the people together, and he rebuilds the walls. He puts back into place the defense protocols and mechanism. He focuses on the economy. He rebuilds the infrastructure. And the text says to us that this all occurred in a mere 52 days, start to finish. And as we reach chapter 8, we realize that even though the outward, visible, physical appearance and structures of the city have been made strong again, even though the muscles are growing within that city, something is still missing. Something of the essence, something for the moment, something critical. And the governor, Nehemiah, he knows it. He knows something is missing. And so does the spiritual leader, Ezra, the, the priest and scribe during this time. Both men know that the health and the vibrancy and the future prosperity of the city consisted of so much more than the strength of the walls. They consisted of so much more than the strength of the economy. They consisted of so much more than the strength of their defense protocols, their commerce, and their infrastructure. They were both convinced that if they did not tend to what was unseen, what was below the surface, what was spiritual in nature, then the city would be just as vulnerable as ever. And the prosperity of the city, and hence the prosperity of the people, would be in jeopardy. To borrow from my opening illustration, we might then ask, so what was it that needed to be tended to? What tendon needed to be stretched what was invisible and below the surface, that if it wasn't addressed, that more pain would come, 
that destruction would prevail once again. What was this thing? Here's what Nehemiah and Ezra knew. They knew that if they were going to be really strong, if they were going to be prosperous, if they were going to be obedient and faithful, they knew that the people needed to hear the word of God. A word that for all intent and purposes had been silent for generations upon generations. They knew they needed the law of the Lord. Because without it, they would not know the things that make for peace. Without it, they would not know how to live and love in a broken world. Without it, they would not know the root of their collective identity. Without it, they would not know their history. Without it, they would not know their future-oriented purpose as the covenantal children of God. Nehemiah and Ezra knew. They knew that if they were going to be faithful then they have to be attentive to God's word. And so Ezra reads this word. We're told he reads it by the water gate. And as a little aside, this water gate, not the hotel in Washington, D.C., this water gate, as part of the city wall, notice that Ezra reads it outside. There's time and place like we're due right now this morning where we need to read our story in sacred spaces like these in the community as it is constituted here today. But what's so interesting about this particular reading is that you would think it would be read in the temple. But even then in the temple, there was a segregation. Men and women were segregated. Children were segregated. And here Ezra is reading the word of God for everybody. Did you hear how Nehemiah is particular about naming that men and women and children were hearing the word of God? It is a foretaste of what God wants to do for all humanity. That this word of God is for all people, for everyone. And Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah says it like this, as Ezra reads, and the ears of all the people were attentive, attentive to the book of the law. They were paying attention. They turned themselves toward it. They were paying attention to something bigger, something far greater than the walls and the economy and the infrastructure. They were paying attention to the very word of God, which provided the moral framework for their living. It was the people's true north, their moral center. And in terms of what it means to live in right relationship with God and what it means to live in right relationship with one another, what it means to live with right relationship uh, with those inside the walls and outside of the walls, they needed this word. They had to hear it. And it's here that I'd like to offer a bit of a contemporary reflection on a text like this one read in our hearing in the 21st century in an urban environment in the city of Atlanta. But let me take a half a step back to talk about the great church reformer John Calvin who once said that the law of the Lord or the word of God makes the conscience keenly aware of its sin. That the word of God, when presented to the people of God, is like a mirror held up to expose us for our depravity and our, and our brokenness. It shows our true selves. I think that's partly why the people were crying when they heard this word that they had they perhaps never heard in their life, this Torah, this law of the Lord, that they're weeping because it's showing to them, it's, it's, it's convicting of them of, of how far apart they were from God and really who they are at, at core. It convicts us that, that only God is God and that we're frail and that we're mortal and that we're prone to sin and prone to wander, as the old hymn says, that in many ways we're broken. An image I have in mind as I was thinking through this point is, is that incredibly sharp turn, and, and many of you know exactly what I'm about to describe to you, that, that incredibly sharp turn where southbound traffic on I-75 actually exits on northbound traffic uh, on I-85. That, that sharp 
curve. And, and, and when I take my boys to school, we'll take 75 north and we'll be able to see that curve from on high. And, and without fail, not a week goes by with the, where there is not a wreck, where there's not a car that's even turned upside down, where there's, there's fire engines and there's ambulances there. And yet, even when you're high up there, you can see the huge signs that say, slow down. The huge signs that say sharp curve, they are right there to see. And for me, this is sort of an image of of my own life. I've got this word of God, and I'm sort of rolled over in the car looking up and saying, "Uh, it exposes me. I see it. I know how I ought to live. I think this is how the word of God in some ways functions in our lives It serves as a guidepost for what makes for peace, what makes for obedience, what makes for justice, what makes for love, what makes for community. It stands over us even when we've crashed and shows us a more excellent way. Because it is completely true, I think, that we in many ways are broken and it is true that we live in a broken world. And I believe that Nehemiah knew that. I believe he was convicted by that. I think that's why he built the walls back up. I think that's why he built the defenses back up. In a broken world, it's true, we need borders. In a broken world, defense mechanisms and safety measures are not automatically by default unfaithful. They're not. In a broken world, these things are necessary. But do not miss the deeper truth that permeates this entire text. Both Ezra and Nehemiah knew that the people needed to be attentive to the word of God so that they would know how to live in a broken world so that they would know how to live within the walls, but also to know that their life is not confined by those walls, to live outside of those walls as well. They needed to hear the word of God so that they would truly understand how to create a just and prosperous economy for everybody. So that they would even know when it was time, because there are times, to tear down walls. They needed this word to know when the time would come where walls would need to be torn down and debt needed to be forgiven and prisoners would be released from captivity and the welcome of the refugee and the stranger would come. And by the way, the book of the law says that that time is all the time when the refugee and the stranger are welcome. As a Christian, I'm committed to the confession that Jesus Christ is the word of God. That as the writer of Hebrews put it, that God has spoken to us through a son. I'm convinced of that. I want to frame it in another way that is more contemporary in nature. Using the words of the Barman Declaration, it was penned by a man who was known as Karl Barth, who who wrote this confession, which is part of our confessions, but it was adopted by many in the confessing church movement in Germany during the 1930s and 40s. It goes like this, Jesus Christ is the one word of God whom we have to hear and whom we have to trust and obey in life and in death. They say we reject the false doctrine that the church could and should recognize as a source of its proclamation beyond and besides this one word of God, to recognize yet other events, powers, historic figures, and truths as God's revelation. In other words, I think what this is saying in summary is that we need to be attentive to Jesus. We must be attentive to him as God's word to us and for us because he is our true north. He is our morning star. He is our moral compass What is more, if he is to be this moral compass, we have to be attentive to the things that he was attentive to. We have to be attentive to the people that he was attentive to. We must pay attention to those purposes, must pay attention to those people. And he clearly marks it as he reads the Isaiah scroll. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to pay attention, in other words, 
to the poor as I bring good news to them. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I want to be absolutely sharp on this one point. Jesus was attentive to God's anointing in his life by being attentive to the least of these. That's how he was attentive in a broken world. That's how he lived in a broken world. He was attentive to the poor. He was attentive to the captive, to the blind, to the oppressed. He came to inaugurate Jubilee which is another way of saying where sins and debts would be forgiven. He came to proclaim jubilee where prisoners' sentences were commuted. We see that in real time here in the city of Atlanta. Thanks be to God that our city has done away with cash bail. Because when you have cash bail, you have two systems of justice, one for the rich and one for the poor. For those who can't post bail, they stay in prison without a trial. And for those who can, they walk free until their trial comes. That's jubilee. That's what Jesus is talking about here, where swords are beaten into plowshares and where the land was given an opportunity to regenerate itself and to be refreshed. That's what Jesus did in a broken world. And let's be very clear on this point. Jesus did not build more walls. That's what the Apostle Paul says. That the dividing wall of hostility between us and between God has been torn down by Jesus Christ. That's how he lived in a broken world. He did not marginalize the poor. He befriended them. He did not perpetuate systems of injustice, but he lived and he died for liberation. He lived and he died for a moral vision that was concerned with what was both seen and unseen. We do live in a broken world that needs borders, that needs defense, that needs structure. But let us pay attention to how Jesus lived in a broken world and lean into his life. I'll close with this. The great poet Mary Oliver, many of you know this, uh, she died in this past week. We, these past weeks, we continue to mourn her death. She once wrote this. She said, attention is the beginning of devotion. We're called, I think, to pay attention and be devoted to Jesus. I, I preached this sermon, obviously, at the 9 o'clock. I had somebody come up to me and said, you know what, maybe we should bring back the WWJD bracelets. What would Jesus do? And I remember having such a negative experience with those back in the mid-90s, late-90s of those things. But you know what? What would Jesus do? He'd be attentive to the lives of the brokenhearted. He'd be attentive to those spiritual tendons that needed to be stretched. He'd be attentive to how justice might prevail over injustice, of how embrace might prevail over exclusion, of how love might prevail over fear. The word of God for us this morning, I believe in great humility, is that we're called to be attentive, like Nehemiah, like Ezra, like those men, women, and children at the water gate. Be attentive to the word of God. And for us, that word is Jesus Christ, the word that we must follow and must obey. Amen. As you are able, please stand and join me in the confession of faith, the Apostles' Creed. People of God, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. 
And we turn now to God in prayer. Let us pray. O God of all creation, you have come to us in Jesus. Lead us in your way of love and fill us with your Holy Spirit. Make strong our hearts in faith that we may trust in your grace. For you remember our names and you forget and forgive our sins. Tend our time together so we don't neglect to gather, share in joys and sorrows, and encourage us in prayer. Lord, make bold our voice of witness that we may name what is evil. Give us your discernment that we may move toward justice. O God of all creation, you have come to us in Jesus. Lead us in your way of love and fill us with your spirit as we pray the words together that your Son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture says, share of what we have, for such a sacrifice is pleasing to the Lord. Let us continue our worship with our tithes and offerings.
giver of every good and perfect gift, we pray that you would accept these our offerings and you would take them, use them, and mold them and mold us for your kingdom work in this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I downloaded a new operating system a few months ago on my phone and it came with a brand new feature which lets me know how much screen time I've had. Some of you have this on your phone. It'll come up every week. It just so happens that it comes up at 9.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings. So after I'm done preaching at the 9, I go over just to see what time it is. And there it is. It lets me know how many minutes, perhaps hours, I've spent on my phone. And I thought, as, I thought about that as what I'd really like is something to tell me how attentive I've been to Jesus. Something to pop up to let me know how often I'm paying attention to what he paid attention to and who he paid attention to and how much I'm paying attention to other words, other powers, other principalities, other things vying for truth or claims of truth in my life and how much time am I paying attention to him. At the core of it, that's what it means to be a Christian is to pay attention to him and to pay attention to what he paid attention to. May his peace, a peace which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. May his peace live inside of you this day and every day of your life. Amen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. For more video content, I'd encourage you to visit our website, firstpressatl.org. We'd love to see you here sometime at the corner of 16th and Peachtree Street to join us for worship. Thanks again for watching.